Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Don Lemon, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. I'm so excited to do this, because, uh, but I have a few things before we announce our beautiful, wonderful, Sunny Hassan. Uh, as the club continues to host virtual events, they are grateful for your continued support uh, in their members and don of their members and donors. So we hope that you'll also consider making a donation. You can do it online or you can text. You can text DONATE. Here's the number. 415-329-4231, 415-329-4231, and you can text the word donate to that number. The club would also like to thank the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event. I like the name of that, Good Lit event. It is my pleasure right now, my just overwhelming, deep, deeply, I can't even tell you how much I love this woman, but it is my pleasure to welcome my very dear friend, Sonny Hostin, Emmy Award-winning legal uh, journalist and co-host of The View. I've worked with Sonny for many years, um, and we have talked about so much. We're like sisters and brothers, and we fight, but it's all love. Her new book is called, here it is, I Am These Truths, okay? It's a memoir of identity, justice, and living between worlds. It is a revealing look at her really incredible story. Sonny grew up in, in the South Bronx, and through hard work, through determination, and the support of her parents, her family, she obtained a law degree. She went on to become a federal prosecutor and was soon recognized for her stellar work prosecuting crimes against women and children. She is a fighter. She is in it for to do good and to help people. After leaving the court, by the way, she went to Notre Dame Law School, so she's amazing. After the courtroom, Sonny became a television legal analyst and was one of the first national reporters to cover Trayvon Martin's death. She broke ground with that. She continues to use her platform to be an advocate for social justice and to provide a powerful voice to the marginalized and voiceless people uh, of, this, of this world, really. I am so thrilled to be here today to discuss her story. We're going to dig into the timely themes that she explores throughout her book. So, and one more note before we get started, just a quick reminder that we're going to be taking audience questions. We may do it at the end, but we may do it uh, throughout, just sort of interwoven in. It just depends on if, it, if something is related to what we're talking about. So please submit your questions in the chat box. Sunny Hostin, yes. welcome. <laughs> we have so much to talk about, my friend. How are you? I'm well. I'm just so happy to be here with you. Even though it's virtual, um, I wish we were you know, there in the same room, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be uh, on this journey with you, my friend. I'm looking for my book here. Thank you. So tell me, why did you decide to write I Am These Truths? You know, I, I just feel that um, the truth um, of it all is that you do hold the power to be the difference. Um, and you know that I've always believed that. And um, I think that at this time, we're in the middle of a pandemic, an economic crisis, um, a national debate over policing, um, a delayed, what I think is a delayed reckoning with systemic racism. Um, and I have been journaling for so long and um, I had been writing and uh, I thought, if not now, when, right? And I had spoken to um, Justice Sotomayor, which that sounds like a huge name drop, <laughs> but it's the truth. Um, I had spoken to her a lot about sharing my story. And my story, as you know, Don, um, has more failures than success. Um, and I, I thought, is it time to, to share that? Um, warts and all, because my story is, is painful. You know, you grow up in the South Bronx projects with teenage parents. Um, and uh, do you want to share all of that? Uh, is it hopeful enough? Is it aspirational enough? And she said, you've got to share it because it is. Um, and it can be a story for other people. And promise me one thing, you do it in Spanish and in English, <laughs> because it's so important for those people that may be struggling with English as their second language, and English, as you know, Don, is my second language, um, with everything that's going on in the world, do that for the little girl or the little boy uh, that will read it in Spanish um, and have some hope. I'm sure you thought, like, what, what, what are people going to learn from me? Is everyone who's writing a book, right, they do that, and I, especially when you um, when you have the humility, when you're as humble as you are, you wonder, like, 
Is anyone going to care about what I write? What can I offer? You said you have more failures um, mm-hmm. than you have successes. But people don't realize it's kind of how life goes, right? You take those failures and those are building blocks to the success. Yeah. But why did you... Why did you feel that way? Why did you feel like, you know, you had all these failures or whatever? And why did you, did you, and did you struggle with thinking that no one's going to care or, you know? Absolutely. And, and I, you know, we're, we're, it's the age of social media. So I get immediate feedback <laughs> every time I'm on the show. And um, I, I would get, you know, and I, I try to be a voice um, for uh, the voices because that seat on the view is so very important. And, you, you know, you would get the I would get these messages like, you know, you're talking about income inequality and you're talking about poverty and you're talking about the struggle. You're sitting on the view. You know, you're wealthy. Um, you don't know anything about it. And I just remember thinking they don't know. Mm-hmm. Like people don't know my story. They don't know how hard it's been. Um, I'm not they, being they see you on the view and they think, Oh, overnight success, overnight yes. success. How yes. have you been working at this for decades? <laughs> decades. You know, I've been a lawyer over 25 years. Um, I've been, you know, on television for a long time. It's just, this, this is just the success you're seeing, but you're not seeing the failures and there've just been so many of them. Um, and so what did you learn from those failures? So, what, so as people are listening, what did you learn from that? I said that they usually, I like to use my haters as motivators and my yeah. failures as building blocks. So what did you learn from those failures? You know, I've learned um, a tremendous amount of resilience. Um, I've learned, my, my father used to always say, "Be uh, you have to be twice as good um, to go uh, half as far. I, I've learned that no one can take excellence from you. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so every time I've, been fired. <laughs> um, and there have been many times, you know, at CNN, uh, there was one time my contract wasn't renewed, but I knew that I had done my best, um, that I have been excellent. Um, and so I could leave with my head up. Um, and I, I, I certainly learned that. And I learned that there would be another day. Um, I learned um, to use my voice, that it was okay. Um, I learned that humility is okay. I actually also learned um, recently that I'm not as good at sticking up for myself uh-huh. as I am as, uh, at sticking up for others. for other people. Who told you that? Um, <laughs> my husband told me. You did. <laughs> no, I told you that. I know Manny told you that. You but, did. Uh, yeah, Sunday night's uh, offices used to be right across from each other, and we would off- often... Um, look to each other for advice and comfort um, and, and feedback. But go on, Sonny, sorry. Yeah, and, and you, you've often said, lean in, Sonny, and you know you don't stick up for yourself. And, and it's so true. Um, and I, I write in the book how it's really easy um, to stick up for other people, to tell other people's stories. It certainly was really hard for me to tell this story because um, I wasn't only telling my story, right? I was telling the story of my parents, I was telling um, my mother's story. My mother didn't speak to me for about a week after she read the book, actually, Um, because I I, I talk about addiction. I talk about uh, mental health and, and, you know, I bear a lot of secrets in that sense. Um, And I I found that, my goodness, I did not want to talk about possible discrimination. I did not want to raise my hand and say, you know, this is happening to me. Is this is this true? Um, Don't treat me this way. I, I should be valued more. I did not want to do those things. Um, and and I, I found that out about myself, which was a little bit shocking that I, I talk the talk and I, you know, I can defend other people and prosecute cases and stick up for victims, but it was really hard for me to do it for myself. Okay, so let me ask you that, because um, I want to ask you about the title of the book, but I have to, I have to just pick up on something that, um, that you said, because I think being where we are in this business, there's a lot of advice that we can offer people that's not, not just in this business, but just in professional life um, anywhere. You said that you could, wouldn't stick up for yourself. Oftentimes, when you get to these positions, and we know as you get up, it's a pyramid. It's rarefied air. There are very few of these kinds of jobs, right? So you want to stick up for yourself. You want to stick up for other people. But then you wonder, you worry that if I do that, am I going to lose my platform? And yeah. therefore, there won't be anyone like me. Oh. You know, with this voice, yeah. was, was that part of it? 
was a huge consideration. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't get an email or uh, a tweet or, um, you know, when pre-COVID, I'd be on the street and and mothers and, and even young people would come up to me and say, oh, my God, thank you for being who you are. You represent me. Um, you know, and that meant a lot for me. And then I, I thought, if I stick my neck out, even for myself, there won't be someone like me on The View or on television. And I remember one of the reasons, and I write about it in the book, one of the reasons, Don, that I, I always wanted to be a broadcast journalist because I, you know, we didn't watch a lot of television when I was growing up. We had one TV in the house and um, I read a lot of books, but we didn't watch a lot of TV what I what we did watch was 60 Minutes. We watched it every Sunday religiously. And I would pre- pretend to be one of the reporters, but there weren't any that looked like me. And my parents were like, don't do that because you, you're not going to be able to feed yourself. <laughs> so I remember the power of representation. And so the thought that I, that I would, you know, take a chance and risk being that representation for those people that would stop me on the street um, was nerve wracking. And I remember asking my family when I was like typing the forward, I, ty- I typed in like 25 minutes because it just poured out of me. I remember thinking, is this, a, is this smart? And I, I showed it to my husband and I said, this is professional suicide, right? And he was like, yeah, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I'll lose my job, right? And he was like, mm, maybe. <laughs> and I did it anyway. Um, See, lean I, in. I you, leaned you in, like you often tell me, because I felt like, my goodness, again, pandemic, economic crisis, national debate over policing, um, African American people of color affected more by this crisis by mm-hmm. everything, yeah. and I don't have the courage to do what I talk about every day on the show. From I would a privileged be a, position. I from a privileged position. I would be a hypocrite. Yeah, there you go. There you go, girl. So I'm I so did proud it. of you. And <laughs> the reason I knew that I, I can so relate to you because you remember when I came out. Do you know how hard that was? I remember we talked about it and you wrote about it in a book. I thought I was going to lose my job. And every, it's like, I'm never going to work in this business again. And I, I leaned yeah. in and I, it, I, it was the total right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. You were, I was living, I always tell people to walk in their own truth living in in your own and so you're living in your own truth is that what, where did the name is that where that name come i am these truths where did that come from yes i came up with the title of the book after it was written um and I, you know in my office i have uh i'm in my office now my home office at my desk where i, where I did a lot of the writing and i have all these stickies uh you know stickies with things on it and uh i have Remember quotes that. from the constitution um oh, and really? i have we hold oh, do you remember I used to keep the Constitution, I mean, a, a copy of the, um, I used to keep a copy of the Constitution on my desk. The little one, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, it says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And my it should be all men and women. Sorry, that's why I'm doing this. But, I'm sitting uh, Lauren here. My foot is so going good. to sleep. Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry, Sonny. Go ahead. That all men are created equal. And um, I, I just started thinking about all the themes in the book about equality, um, and systemic racism and pay inequity. And I was like, you know, I'm finally telling the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and these are my truths. And I hope it encourages people to, to not be ashamed of where they come from and just tell the truth. And I was like, wow, I am these truths. Hmm. That's, where it, that's where it came from because it's very powerful to say that the truth of it all is that we are equal and that we hold the power to be the difference. And you are, I, you are people, and I, people of color, immigrants, you are the American story. So yeah. when someone tries to otherize immigrants and people of color, it's doubly insulting because of the work that people of color did, um, no pay, slavery, all those things, building things. And so when people try to otherize you and make you feel like you're not an American, you're, yeah. Is, is that infuriating for you? It's painful. Mm. It's, it, it used to make me angry, but now it's painful. 
Um, and one of the things that I thought about when I was writing the book, you know, um, I'm like, why do people still question my, my background, my yeah. ethnicity? Um, why is it so odd? You know, uh, we had just come, uh, when I was writing it, we had just come um, up uh, after, it had just come up again. We had interviewed uh, a family on the show and it was a, a Spanish speaking family. Um, and one of the family members, the grandmother didn't speak English. So I conducted the interview of her in Spanish and I would translate for the audience. And I got all these like obnoxious tweets, like Sonny must be Spanish today. Why is she speaking with a Spanish accent? And it was just that I was pronouncing the words properly. And I, I realized that my parents got married in 1968, just a year after the loving decision when interracial couples were allowed to be married, right? And my mother, you've met my mom, Don, she's uh, a white Hispanic, uh, also Jewish descent, right? Mm -hmm. So, and my father's a black guy. Um, so when they got married, it had just become legal. And I was like a unicorn. There really weren't people that looked like me. So people kind of stare at our family. And, you know, I write about in the book how they tried to live in Georgia, which is really kind of crazy. And the KKK ran them out of town. Um, and so for me, I had been otherized my entire life, even though I'm only 50 in my 50s. It was just unusual. So I think that is why. I've lived that life of, of a struggle of identity, but it saddens me that 50 years later, people still question it because they still want to put you in this box. I don't understand. Category. People, people have to be able to categorize something in order to feel um, like they, to, to be comfortable, right? Yeah. I, I can understand a little bit, but not as much as you, because I wrote about in my book and I talk about the experience in Louisiana, you know, the brown paper bag light skin versus dark skin. So like in the winter, I was light skin, so I could hang out with the light skin black folk. And then in the summer, I was dark skin, so I had to hang out with the dark oh. skin. Weird color thing. Um, but I remember when we had this conversation about, you're like, Don, you, you realize that people on CNN, they don't know that I'm Latina. They just mm -hmm. think in terms of African-American, most of the country, African-American and white, black and white. Yes. And so, and I said, well, Sonny, let people know that you're Latino. It's okay to yeah, be, but you, you felt stuck in that world, that I did. In a no man's land, sort of. Am I this? Am I that? Am I kind of both? Like, do I have to choose one? I did. And it was uh, for a lot of reasons, you know, and it was weird because our offices were right next to CNN Español. Right. <laughs> they never asked me to do any reporting. <laughs> I was like, well, that's kind of weird. Um, and and I, I think, one of the reasons I write about also in the book, one of the reasons that, um, and I blame myself, um, is because I changed my name. My real name's Asuncion. As Asuncion. Right? Asuncion. I call you Asuncion. <laughs> yes, that's my real well, name. How did, how did it morph? Did you morph to make it more American or cuter or friendlier? To tell me about it. I know yeah. you write about it, but I want you to tell the, the people. The story is, <laughs> I was, uh, I've always been Asuncion. My family calls me Asuncion. My friends uh, from back in the day all call me Asuncion. Um, when I was in college, there were a couple of people that would say, ah, 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 and I noticed it. And so I would say, you know, you can call me whatever you want to. And they would say, how about sunshine? I'd say, okay, call me, you know, that's fine. How about sunsea? That, okay, fine. So they called me sunny, sunsea, sunshine. When I started doing court TV with Nancy Grace, who is a great friend of mine, uh, she could not pronounce my name. And when I say could not, the struggle was real. Like she would be like, and joining me as the co-host today is Austin. Awesome. 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 I mean, she just, it was just, you could see the struggle. And at one of the breaks, she said, can I say something to you? I said, yes, Nancy, what would you like to say? I knew what it was about. And she said, this, this name thing, this Asuncion, Asuncion, no one can pronounce it. They can't say it. And I said, well, what would you like me to do about my name, Nancy? <laughs> and she said, do you have a nickname? And I felt the pressure at that point when I have this legal legend telling me, you know, this name is not going to cut it. I said, well, a lot of people call me Sunny. Right then, she said, change the Chiron. Sunny, S-U-N-N-Y. I mean, she even put the, the, I mean, I didn't even have a spelling for it. <laughs> and she changed it. 
And I, I just went with it, to be honest with you. I didn't like it, but I went with it. And after that, my career kind of took off. She and knows TV. She so, knows TV. And the thing is, is that sometimes, Sonny, people get, and maybe rightfully so sometimes, people get offended, but sometimes people just are looking out for your, for your well-being and they she know was. that she was like, this will work for you because I know TV. That's so what she told sometimes me. Sometimes you just have to roll with it and lean in. That's what she told me. Don always tells me to lean in. That's <laughs> what she told me. And I write about that in the book. She told me that. She said, you know, you're going to make it in this business. I haven't seen yeah. anyone do this as well as you without any training. You were made to do this. But that name is going to hold you back. People can't remember it. And I got to tell you, she was right. But I felt like I sold a piece of myself. My grandmother never forgave me for it because I was named after her sister. Um, people would sort of stop me when I was with her and say, hi, Sonny. And she would be like, no, I Sonny aquí. You know, and it would like infuriate her. Um, and I do think that at CNN, if I were Asuncion Hostin, just like Soledad was Soledad O'Brien, people would have known my identity. Um, yeah. And so I kind of did that to myself. And if I had to do it again, I wouldn't have changed my name. You, you would not have? No, I would not have. I would not have. <laughs> I know, I would not have. And I can't go back now. Everybody knows me now. Well, I didn't. So my first news director, my first not my uh, in when I was a reporter, when I went left New York and went to Birmingham, said she wanted me to change my name. She didn't like the last name Lemon. Oh. And I was just I knew in TV, like if it's snappy and something that people can remember, it's great. And I'm like, Don Lemon, that's a name that right. people change their name to. For TV. Like, <laughs> no, I'm not. She wanted to be like Don J Clark, Don Johnson, Don, what, like something really simple. And I'm like, no one will ever remember that. But no. everyone will remember Don Lemon. Don Lemon. Everyone remembers Sonny. And they're I like, know. Sonny, but I we, know. you know who you are. I want to ask you this because you talk about, you talk about, um, you know, you were uh, too light skinned for the black community, too dark skinned. People didn't get it, right? I, yeah. This is F. F. Scott Fitzgerald. I want to ask you about this. Wrote mm -hmm. in 1936 in an essay. It's called The Crack Up. The test of a first rate intelligence, of a first rate intelligence, is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Why do you think it's so hard for people, even intelligent people that you've worked with in the past, to understand that someone can be black and Latina? I know. <laughs> It's really fascinating, isn't it? I mean, uh, look at Barack Obama, right? The president is half black and half white, um, but, but nobody can, can really reconcile that. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the history of this country. Um, the one drop rule, where if you were one drop uh, black, you were considered black. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, I remember growing up, um, you wait, wait, can we just talk about that for a little bit? That one drop was important yes. because you could yeah. be 99.9% .9 something else, but if you had just a smidge of black in you, you yes. were you were black, black. go on. I'm and sorry. um, because of that history in the country, you know, uh, legal documents reflect that. Um, and you know, race is just a social construct anyway, and yeah. so it we my my life experience reflected that. And so, you know, on my birth certificate, it says black. And then it also says Hispanic, which is interesting because I looked back at it um, and it says mother white. And then it, interesting, right? Yeah. Um, and but w when you would fill out, um, you know, any standardized test, you had to choose black, white or Hispanic. And I would sometimes try to circle everything and it would reject <laughs> the form. Of course you did. <laughs> reject the form. Um, and I, I, I think, again, it just goes back to the history of our country um, and the way people are indoctrinated to this day. And if you, I remember feeling, if I choose one, does that mean my mother doesn't exist. If I choose, you know, the other, does that mean my father doesn't exist and, and who I am in all my complexity? I, I, I really believe that is, that is it, it is unique to this country because I've traveled mm -hmm. a lot of places 
and um, I'm accepted in more complexity in those other places than I am here. That's America. That's, that is an American thing. So I think that is, that personifies what we're going through right now, right? People who, yeah. are you, they've got to put you in a box. So even now, people want to put you in a box. Everyone is so divided. There's no nuance. Because people could not understand, Sonny, when we were on CNN together, like you can hold two thoughts at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I, mean, I could just go at it on TV. I completely disagree with you. What is wrong? Why do you think that? And then we would go have a drink later. It's like, it's fine. What, what's, but people, can, what is, people can't do that anymore. What is it about the country, you think, and society that uh, can't pull two thoughts at the same opposing views? I, I know that now it is um, worse than it's ever been. Um, and I remember sort of honing that skill um, when I prosecuted cases. Um, at the Justice Department, I write a little bit about it in the book in the sense that I would argue to the death in the courtroom. You know, if you were the defense attorney, you knew when I walked in, I needed to win because I was prosecuting child sex crimes and I felt that I was on the white horse and I was coming in to save the day and you stood in my way. Mm -hmm. And I went to the wall with it and we would argue and then we'd go out for drinks. And some of these defense attorneys were my closest friends, much like you and I are dear friends and we would battle on CNN's air, much like we do on The View, right? People are always shocked that Megan and I are friends, even though we may battle it out and say all kinds of crazy things to each other on air, um, we can go out and drink our bourbon later. And unfortunately, I think that that kind of respect for difference of opinion um, is gone um, it's in, in our country right now. It's yeah. just gone. And it, 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 it requires this kind of relationship that we have, Don, requires a respect for a difference of opinion. A level of forgiveness and understand, of being curious rather than judgmental. Oh, oh, it definitely requires intellectual curiosity. Right. Um, and, and a lot of people, unfortunately, um, don't have that. And they certainly don't have a respect uh, for difference of opinion. And when you talk about intellectual curiosity, what that means, in my view, is why is this person saying that? Mm-hmm. And what experience has led this person to say that? And hmm, do I see value in that? There is always value in a different opinion. And, and how that person got to it, if only for you to strengthen your feelings about something else, the opposite opinion, if yeah. only to make you do that, feel that way. Um, and for some reason, um, we can't do that anymore. Um, and I, I, would, I would point to the relationship that um, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had with Justice Scalia. You read their opinions and some of their dissents and, and, oh. and you would think they hated each other. That one's hard for me because I know I mean, <laughs> like some curiosity, but sometimes I'm like, okay, well, oof, they're making law. I mean, I just, know, they, they, they went out to lunch together every Friday. They were yeah. quite fond of each other, but they so, didn't agree on anything. Yeah. So I, listen, I think we need more of that. I do. I, I should have, you know, I left out a very important part that your dad also had to change his name in the seventies. And then here you are in the two thousands having to change your name. Did you talk to him about he that? Did. Yeah. And, and I write about it and, um, you know, he did it. Um, and we call it code switching now. You know, there are all these words for it. Um, I know. Cause I t- like, it, and you know, what's weird though, Sonny, the code switching is like, you know, you talk to people and then one way and then like Sonny and I like, Hey, what's up? Whatever you, you talk that way. But after a while, if you get to a certain position, it all kind of becomes one thing and you just do it. Like it's much more natural now. And if you don't, I, know. I find now it doesn't surprise people when, like I told Chris the other night on the air, I'm like, you stupid. <laughs> And I, was, I know that was not proper English, but I just, that's how we talk to each other. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's true. It's, and, and also, I will tell you, I feel like the code switching comes, it's so exhausting sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, but my father, when, when my parents um, were, were coming up, again, it's, it's now the early 70s. And this, this in, interracial couple, they're trying to get an apartment in Manhattan, oh. trying to get out of the South Bronx. They've got me. I've just been skipped a grade. 
My school can't really teach me, you know, properly. I've seen my uncle get stabbed in front of me. They're like, we got to get out of the projects. So they start trying to interview together for apartments. And the minute they kind of show up, no part, the apartment's no longer available. And what my, my mother realizes is her name's Rosa was her maiden name was Rosa Besa, right? So she realizes, hmm, if I change Rosa to Rose and my father's uh, name is Cummings, his last name, if I become Rose Cummings and I show up with my light hair and my light eyes, I'm going to get the apartment if I show up mm. alone. My father realizes when he sends his resume out as an IT guy, if he uses Willie Moses Cummings, there ain't a lot of white guys named Willie Moses, right? <laughs> but if he changes it to Bill Cummings, and William Cummings, he's going to get the job. So he changed his name to Bill Cummings. And wow. my mother changed her name to Rose Cummings. We got the apartment in Manhattan and he got the job. Wow. And that's just the way it was. What is what saddens my dad is that it we still do it today, hmm. um, and it it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Um, but it I is. I think it was different. For there's a little bit of difference. I understand how you feel about your name. Trust me, and I and and especially because of your grandmother and this. You know, it's ownership. They're proud of you as a as a mm-hmm. you know as we say. Can I say Latina, right? A Blackina. Blackina. Afro Latina. And they want you to be a but you didn't do it because you, you know, you did it because Sonny was just easy and it was perfect and it fit. Yeah, right. It fit. So but I understand. I understand how now if you're looking back, you have the success that you have, you wouldn't have to change your name. People would know, and it's a different time now. But I, I have to ask you, because we're talking, you know, we always ask, what would you go back and tell your younger self, right? Because mm. you've dealt with you've dealt with you were nervous about, um, you miscarried, you about medical, you know, fair treatment with medicine, all, being a woman that has kids in this business, and so on and so forth. So I want to ask you, when you look at what's happening now, this racial reckoning, we had the, I call it the summer of George Floyd, the summer of unrest. Oh, yeah. Okay, what would you, if you could go back and tell your younger self in the wake of, of and Jacob's Blake, Jacob Blake shooting, Hmm. What would you tell yourself back when you were reporting about Trayvon Martin or back when you were entering law school or back when you were entering news television? What would you say to that, Sonny? Wow. That's a tough one, Don. I didn't know you were going to ask that. Um, (laughs) What would I tell my younger self? I would, uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I definitely thought that if you did the excellent work, um, that you would succeed. And um, I think that was a very simplistic way of looking at things. I think if I'm being honest in the seat that I sit in right now, I would advise my younger self that um, it isn't a meritocracy. And to be ready for that, Um, that it isn't just uh, working uh, really hard and being excellent, that uh, those things help, but go on. They help, but that it isn't just a meritocracy and that indeed um, you do have to um, look out for those potholes and you do have to. Um, in a sense, play the game and be more strategic, like you always advise me to do, Don. And, you can always uh, be at 100. You got to be strategic. Gotta, <laughs> so yeah. he's always like, Rest. you are a fighter. You are an <laughs> activist at heart. And I'm like, Sonny, that's great. But you can't always, you got to be strategic. <laughs> be, be more strategic. Um, and um, certainly um, be more of an advocate for self. Mm. Um, uh, I, I think I would, I would, uh, tell myself, I, I, I often thought that, um, as you know, Don, um, because I'm always on a hundred, that it's only about the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just not, it's, it's not only about the work. It, it's, a, there's a bigger picture there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You need, as, as we call now work life balance, but, um, 
what I so admire about you is, is your activist and your fighting spirit and also your love of family and your sense mm-hmm. of family and the kind of mom that you are and, and daughter. I, <laughs> I mean, you are, you are well-rounded. I mean, you know, I don't know how, I think women are the smarter <laughs> and <laughs> most successful of the sexes because you guys can juggle so much, take care of the home, you bring home the bacon, you do the business, <laughs> you do all that, you raise kids, you produce children. <laughs> If men had to do that, it would be a completely different. Yeah. So, um, Sunny, let's. I want to go to some viewer questions, okay? Or yeah, some okay. Of the questions coming from the chat. The, the, the type is really small, so forgive me. If I'm, <laughs> um, this is from uh, I think is Kiwa Kawa, Kawa, Kawashi. Okay, um, in this time of racial injustice, Sunny, COVID, natural disasters. How can we channel our anger and despair into positive action? Um, so, and then there, and then there's another question for both of us, which yeah. is, what do you admire about one another? But first, do that. How do you how do you channel your anger and despair? Are people asking how they can do it in, yeah. into positive action during this time. Um, as Don mentioned, I am always on a hundred. <laughs> uh, I I always feel um, like there's work to be done. Um, And I I start the book out by saying, you know, I was born in 1968. You've got the backdrop of the civil rights movement. Um, You've got the backdrop of uh, President Kennedy, uh, the assassinations of President Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, I was born into that. Um, So I feel like- of unrest. Unrest. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I get it honest. You know, my spirit gets it honest. I, I really feel like when- um, we need people to understand that um, you do hold the power um, to be the difference. And it, it doesn't have to be in these big ways. I think people feel powerless because they feel like, well, I don't have this big platform and I, I can't do, you know, what, what, what do I do? If you feel angry, um, uh, that doesn't mean that you, you have to channel that anger. And, and that could be in many ways. That could be um, in being a poll worker, right? right? And making sure that people are, are not turned away um, inappropriately. It could be uh, as simple as um, making sure that um, uh, you, you go to your local uh, meeting and, and make sure that your local school district is doing right by the kids um, uh, in, in terms of the COVID plan. Um, it, it could be protesting um, mm-hmm. or organizing a protest, uh, getting a group of friends together and, and, right. and virtually planning something, um, bringing five people with you to vote. Uh, there, there are so many ways, I think, to harness that anger in a positive way to affect change. I often think about the stats when you think about, um, and, and, and this is not a partisan thing, um, you know, if you were, let's say you were a Hillary person and you decided not to vote because you didn't think your vote would count. You didn't think you could make a difference. Well, Hillary lost um, Michigan by 11,000 votes. And in some districts, she lost by seven votes, seven votes. Imagine if one person thought that they made a difference and took six friends. Right. That yeah. would have been the difference. So that's how I feel like you channel your energy in whatever, you know, you make your passion, your purpose and do something, just something. Yeah. Um, and and it, as you said, it doesn't always have to be 100. It doesn't always have to be a fight. It doesn't always have to be um, something that involves the legal system or police or any of that. I, I had an experience recently as we were going through this George Floyd thing where I went into a store I went to a store and they were opening and I walked by on the sidewalk and I said, Oh, I wanted to buy something out of the store. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, I can sell it to you, but you can't come in because of COVID, which I certainly understood. Mm -hmm. And so I bought the the thing. And then um, as I was walking back to, for something like a bag, I forget or something. I saw this woman inside the store, this white lady shopping. It looked to me like it was shopping. And I said to him, I said, um, I thought, what's going on? And he said, Oh, uh, She's training. And so I wasn't sure if she was training or not. I didn't, and I didn't want it to go to 100. I didn't want to be like, oh, because I didn't know exactly what, what it was. 
But I asked him what was going on, and he he knew from the look that I gave him and the conversation we were having, he got it. I returned the items, and I said, I'm just not comfortable doing this. I don't want it to be a big deal, but here are your items and whatever. And he sent it back, but he got it. He got it. So yeah. he, he had his lesson in that moment without it being a big deal. No one, yeah. I'm not going to say the shop owner, but it, is, it was just a thing. So you're right. You have to measure and figure out how to do that, right? Yeah, what, how to what, do that. What, what's the appropriate steps? Make a stand. Uh, and yeah. and, and it, it could be however small, but do something. Yes. Do, do something. No, I said, so, so, what do you admire about one another? I think I said that. I told you what I admire about you, but I can add to that. Um, I love how, Sonny's ambition, but it's not blind ambition. It's, it's ambition in the right way. Um, and I like that you are able to evolve. I like the evolution that is Sonny. And I've told you what else I've admired about Sonny. You don't have to say what you admire about me. Well, but, I, you know, I admire a lot of things about you. Um, Don, what, what a lot of people don't know is Don is so supportive of others. Yes. So supportive, um, and not just of me, because I've seen that support across the board for a lot of people. Um, it, there, there are many days when I will get a text from Don, um, which will be as, as small as, you know, how you doing? Or I just watched the show. That was badass. Well yeah. done. Um, or you could lean in here. Yeah. Um, you could have done this better. But I always know he's watching and he's supporting and he wants you to be your best. Yeah. And in this business um, and in life, even there aren't that many people that are like in your corner yeah. who want you to be a better version of yourself. Yeah. And I, I've always appreciated that. Right? Thank you, Sonny, because I listen, we're so lucky. I am so lucky to have this position. And I say lucky because, yeah, I think that I'm talented and you know, fine. But there's a certain degree of luck being in the right place at the right time. Right? But there are so few people like me and you in these positions that we, I think we have, we must look out for each other. I'm not in competition with you. No. I, I don't feel like no one can do me like I can. Exactly. Right? No one can do you like you can. But here's the thing too, Sonny, I think that people should know. I'm, it's not always just sweetness and flowers. Oh, you look great. I'll say, Sonny, don't get mad at me, but that lighting today, Mm -mm. Don't let them yeah. do, mm -hmm. <laughs> do that to you, right? And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and you can tell me that you know what off, and I'll be like, okay, that's not my business. All or right? even don't forget to ask this. Yes. If you know this, ask this next. And it's so help. It's so helpful. A lot of people won't do that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So listen, uh, I, 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 that's not the name of the, um, of the person who's asking the question. Sorry, that's the name of the person who's sending me the question. So listen, oh. <laughs> as a prosecutor, who is also a person of color. How do you view policing in America? What needs to change, Sonny Hostel? Mm, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I used to get a lot of flack. Oh, by the way, thank you for that. Sorry, go on. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I used to get a lot of flack, actually, um, uh, for being a black prosecutor, right? A, a prosecutor of color, because a lot of times when people, uh, people of color go into uh, criminal law, they certainly don't go into that side of the law. They become civil rights uh, lawyers, they become defense attorneys, um, even judges, but certainly not prosecutors. But people need to know the prosecutor is the most powerful person in the courtroom. And I write about this, uh, not the judge, not the defense attorney, it's the prosecutor. For those That's why I was so happy that you had such insight on uh, Daniel Cameron yeah, um, in Kentucky, because you're like he's saying I couldn't do this because of this, because of this, because of this, and putting on other. You're like, no, no, no. The prosecutor <laughs> has the power. Has the power. So the prosecutor perfect. runs the narrative. You know those things. Go. Sorry. Go on. Right. Well, people that are upset about like the like Breonna Taylor and the what's Breonna happening. Taylor case, yeah. and they're not being an indictment there. Be upset because Daniel Cameron was the prosecutor. He had the power to bring the charges. He had the power to put the narrative in front of the grand jury and he chose a different narrative. Yeah. And that's why I chose to be a, a, a person of color as a prosecutor. So um, what needs work, to change? Yeah, and, well, and you work intimately with police officers. I know firsthand they have a very difficult job. They want to get back home to their families as well. The problem um, is multifactorial, but 
the police officers that I worked with and that I am still friends with tell me that they are sent into situations that they are not prepared for, nor that they want to deal with. They are sent into schools to police children. They don't want to be there. Um, they are also sent to deal with mental health situations. They don't want to do that either, nor are they prepared to do that. They're not trained to deal with that. Um, they are sent into situations of sort of broken policing. Um, they don't want to do that either. They want to police it, murder um, cases. They want to deal with high level drug cases. Um, they want to do real policing. And so when you hear about this movement of defund the police, whether or not you disagree with the terminology, um, it's really about arming um, police departments across the country with the right tools to police appropriately. And that may be diverting funds to mental health professionals to answer those calls, diverting funds so that you have school um, uh, professionals, professionals in schools that are dealing with troubled children as opposed to guidance counselors, or, yeah. guidance counselors, things of that nature. And so that police officers can do police work, which is what they want to do. So I think we are sending police uh, into situations where they have no business um, deal, uh, dealing with. I also think that um, we have over-militarized our police departments. Uh, there is no reason why police departments have um, armored vehicles and uh, uh, these assault weapons that are used in war, uh, bayonets in some police departments. Um, there's no reason why, you know, the police departments have huge budgets for settlements because they're not, <laughs> because they are killing black and brown people as opposed to having in their budgets money for training, bias training, um, how to, you know, de-escalate. So there's a problem with training and resources that mm. doesn't seem to be fixed ever. Um, I, I, and, you know, I also think that we need more people of color that are not only enrolled in police academies, but are also elevated into positions of uh, supervisory positions so that they can um, teach lower level police officers how to effectively police in communities of color. So you think that we need to just, as, as people say, reimagine policing in this country because we've gotten used to it being a certain way and we think that, well, that's the best way. That's how, maybe it isn't. I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But it I, isn't. it's interesting to me when people are offended by it. I understand when they are, like the whole, like the term defund the police is, you know how I, I told you about that. I'm like, Sonny, oh, it just. He hates it. He, Don hates it. We got into this little argument about it. Yeah. Look, do you really because think that people on the street were were like crowdsourcing that term and, and, and taking it to advertising agencies and, and make, you know figuring out whether or not that was an appropriate term? This is something that sprung up. I'm sure if they if they took it to an advertising or marketing agency, they would have come up with something different. Like, like, you know, <laughs> the police. <laughs> but they didn't. It's, it's not so much about the term. It's about the ideas that come from yeah. it. Yeah, I get it. But you know what? I'm just saying in an election year, you got to be, you know what I'm saying? Because you, yeah. you will, just because people are hyper aware and, 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 and even more so, the people who um, don't want what you want are going to use it as a cudgel. Yeah. They're, right? they're, <laughs> they're, they're using it. Yeah. It's true. It's true. But you just, you've got to realize that that's not what it's about. And I do write about policing and you know, prosecuting these cases in the book. Um, because you write about I, almost I everything a, we've talked about in, the, in me. Yeah. You write about it in some way in this book. Yeah, I had a bird's eye view to that. Yeah. You know? uh, so, I mean, that and, you know, how to, being successful, being a mom, being a prosecutor, uh, race. You write about all of that stuff uh, in the book. So I, speaking of, uh, another uh, viewer question. Sonny, what is the most significant professional learning you, you have experienced as it pertains to race relations? And then there's just a follow-up. What I've learned... In, uh, where? What I've learned... In, what is the most significant professional learning you have experienced as it pertains to race relations? So probably it's like, what is the biggest... What have you learned the most? I don't know. Maybe there's what, what ex one experience that you had. 
What is the biggest, <laughs> what is the most significant professional learning you have experienced as it pertains to race relations? You know, I think that um, my recent experience um, at ABC, um, if I'm being honest, um, has been, was really eye-opening. Um, and I, I start the book out with it in that um, we don't talk. Go ahead. What, so Sonny had, Sonny had, um, Sonny experienced someone who was, um, who had a big role in her career at the company and was in, in charge of people like Sonny, who is accused of making um, insensitive racial remarks, um, which included Sonny. Um, I said accused, right? And I want to be said, uh, and, um, and it was an investigation and she was she was and she was fired she was terminated or, she, or had to leave however i just want to be very you know what i'm saying i don't want to get sued you're the whatever yeah. so anyways and sunny um and it was it, it it was some very um harsh things unprofessional uh about sunny and sunny fought back and she is continuing to fight back so yeah. um, and that that is recent and, and yeah and it was recent it was just this summer um, and so, uh, for me professionally, did I characterize it properly? Yeah, it was, it was a, a, a person that was responsible for contract negotiations, uh, for, for my career, as well as development of my career. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of race relations, you know, um, what was, what I learned was, uh, that I think we go through life again, thinking that it's a meritocracy. Um, that they can't take, people can't take excellence away from you. Um, uh, my father taught me that, my mother taught me that. But what I did learn, unfortunately, is that it's not just a meritocracy and that race does still play a role um, in our lives, um, an outsized role in this country. And um, we do um, have to speak up and speak out about that. Although I was very reluctant to do that, um, I, I chose to um, talk about it, write about it. Obviously I started the book with it. Um, and what I learned is that, you know, while I thought it was professional suicide, in fact, um, people at least at ABC were very um, open about, wow, Thank you for telling us this is how you felt, how you experienced this, and we need to recalibrate. And what can we do to make it better? And how can we be better? Whereas I thought there was going to be this reluctance to talk about it. There was a reluctance to talk about it initially, because when I first wrote the book and handed it in, the response I got was, no, 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 you can't talk about this stuff. You got to take it out. And I was like, but I'm not going to take it out. No, but you got to take it out, but I'm not going to take it out. <laughs> and I went so far as to hire a lawyer because I felt like this was my truth and this was my experience. Um, but now, um, fast forward, that we're going through this delayed sort of racial reckoning of systemic racism and people are talking about it and protesting it. I've seen a real sea change because now the response has been, how can we make it better? Yeah. Um, and, and so that's what I've learned. That's been a, a real professional, uh, change for me. And that, personal, because you were standing up for yourself as we began this conversation, you were standing up for yourself. And that is something that you wouldn't do in the beginning. As I said, what I admire about you is the evolution that you have had. Yeah. Um, and so what happened to you, unwittingly, you didn't understand this at the time. You probably don't know. You ended up helping others by just standing in your own truth. I have, I, and I'll tell you this offline, I got, uh, because you know this person, I just got a, a text from someone right before we, we started this uh, that said, I'm reading your book, um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm experiencing the same thing um, and I really needed to um, read it and uh, I'm going to take some action myself. And I was just floored that you know, what I thought would be professional suicide um, turned out not to be that. And it is giving other people the courage um, to speak out. But I think it is the moment that we're in in this country. I See, really but, the, 
the power one hat you have as an individual, you don't think that you have that power. You don't. Yeah, but you do. And Sonny, you do. And, and other people do um, as well. Yeah. To, to what extent, someone wants to know, Sonny, is social media responsible for the demise of civility and the ability to communicate like human beings? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, you know, I feel like social media is, um, it's sort of like this like two-headed dragon, right? We get so much from it. I think back, Don, and, and I think you and I both covered a little bit of this was like the Arab Spring, right? It was, it, was, oh, yes. it can be used to such good um, and then it can be used to the detriment of so many people. Uh, my, my husband and I were just watching this documentary, The Social... Um, uh, the Social Network. The so, uh, no, not The Social Network. It's, it's new. I saw uh, it. It's on Netflix, right? Yeah, it'll you, come you know to what me. You're talking about. Yeah. yeah, it'll come to me. And, and, the social and construct we, or The Social Something. Yeah. And it, like, we immediately like, changed screen time for the kids because we're like, wow, it is that destructive. And I think the reason that it, it's destructive and it goes to some of the themes in the book is because people would, will say things to each other um, that they would never say in person, right? Or they wouldn't even say like this virtually because we can see each other. People become anonymous. And so now all of a sudden they have these Twitter thugs in their mama's basements and, and, and they're, they, they have this fake and faux courage um, and, and it emboldens people to, to lose all decorum. Um, and it, it just sort of um, just keeps on replicating. And I think it's led to the demise of, of true civility. And we've seen it from the top. I mean, there hasn't been in our history a president who um, is willing to insult people um, on social media. With, it, that, with no qualms about it. It's like remarkable. It's the social dilemma, by the way. The social dilemma. It's kind of remarkable. And, and I think um, social media has given everyone permission um, to say these nasty things. I mean, if I read to you the things that people say about me on social media, I'm <laughs> sure you get it done. Oh, I know. I'm like, I mean, and I'm pretty thick skinned, you know, I'm from the project. So like, I've heard it all, but every now and then I'm like, oh, <gasps> <Yeah. laughs> wow. I have, um, I have, I have limited my uh, comments on certain social media sites. So just to people I follow or who, you know, um, yeah. it's, I didn't it's know you unbelievable. Can do that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you can. It's what you can, especially on Instagram and you can do it on Twitter as well, especially you can, the ones that you see and you can set it where not everybody can respond to something that you tweeted. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. So, because yeah, you, I called, I called Twitter to hook me up and then okay. you can it's just, you can turn off your, yeah, go on, if you, it's on Instagram. Bad. Yeah. Um, but I, I love the exchange of ideas. I love, I, know, the, I, I love the feedback, but um, it, it just, it has led to this incivility that I never thought that I would see. You want to hear the love and the hate from the people you respect. You don't have to hear it from the people you don't know or respect. So you can, you know, I was, you don't have to, you know, everyone loves you. You want to see all those comments because you want to see in some way, oh my God, this person loves me, whatever. But then they don't, you get upset. You don't need to but see that. I want that. the criticism because if I'm getting it wrong, right? And, and I, I, I want to know that. I I'm also tell you, son. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to know that. I mean, I, I'm such a, and you know this, Don, I'm such a firm believer in the freedom of speech. I want to hear from people, but I am always shocked again at the crass and um, just real. the sheer incivility of it. Yeah. It's okay, Sonny, can we do um, can we do a, a lightning round? Because we literally have just a couple minutes left. Oh, and no. I, go, okay. I know. Can you believe that? I want to go fast because I want to get these in. Sonny, um, why did you want to become a lawyer? If there is one question you could ask the President Trump, what would it be? Okay, so first of all, why did you want to become a lawyer? Oh, you, I, wanted to, I wanted to fight for people. I, I wanted to be, be someone's superhero. And I thought, I thought that would be the best way to do it. Is there one question that you would like to ask President Trump? What, what would it be? Are you, are you doing all of this because your father um, didn't show you enough love? Woo. And it says President Biden. Oh, what, what would I ask President Biden? Yeah. Oh, um, 
how are you going, what is the first thing you would do to restore the soul of this country? Mm. Uh, wow, those are good questions. I, I, I think I would have two. One is, um, why are you so jealous of Barack Obama? <laughs> That's a good one. You know the answer to that, though. Now, now it's it's because Barack has more money than he has. <laughs> and I mean, if the question it was, uh, if you had to get the truth, if it was like a truth serum, it would be, and how much taxes did you really pay or didn't pay? Saying it's <laughs> okay. So um, after writing this book and sharing such personal experiences, is there anything that surprised you or that you learned about yourself? Hmm. Um, you know, when I, I wrote the chapter on motherhood, which was the hardest chapter for me to write, because I share that uh, I went through infertility, five miscarriages, um, and I almost lost my son uh, wow. during the pregnancy. Uh, and I hadn't actually told my children that they were IVF babies. Uh, and so I had to share that with them before the book came out. Um, I, I learned, and when I narrated the book, because I narrated the audio book, um, I sobbed in the um, in the booth, and I knew that I was that I had a really tough time um, when I when I was going through all of this. But I realized that I really have fallen into a deep depression when mm. I. Um, and I realized that about myself because I'm generally such a happy person. You know that, Don. Like, I have yeah. a part in my head at all times. <laughs> I'm just a very happy person. Sonny, calm down. You're too happy right now. <laughs> I know. I'm always happy. I'm in a bad mood. But I, <laughs> that sounds like Don. But I, I learned that about myself that I really, um, I, I have a new found empathy for uh -huh. people that deal with mental illness um, because I, I really, um, felt all the pain that I uh, felt when I narrated that part of the book. All right. Okay. So here's a, I have the last question for you. And this is uh, my question that I always ask. Who do you think you are, Sonny House? I think that I am Asuncion. And I think I am the beneficiary of my parents' sacrifice and the love and dreams of my ancestors. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> thank, Sonny, thank you. And I, we have to get together when this is, when we're off of, you know, limited house arrest or whatever it is we're on. So I would love that. Do more than a virtual hug and, and text. So I would like to thank Sonny Hostin. Everyone can applaud there where you are. Co-host of The View, the author of I Am These Truths. It is a memoir of identity, justice, and living between worlds. We encourage you to support our local bookstore, your local bookstore, I should say, and pick up your copy of Sonny's new book today. And if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the uh, Commonwealth Club, efforts, you can visit this www.commonwealthclub.org. My name is Don Lemon, and I thank you for being here. I thank you. I thank Sonny for everything. You guys are amazing. Sonny, you're amazing. Stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Bye, Sonny. Bye, everybody. <laughs>